In this video, I'm going to take an overview look at the app that we're going to build on our course that covers Android Q, Kotlin, MVVM, Live Data, Firebase, and several other emerging topics. In this course, I'm going to build an app with you from the ground up, from concept all the way to completion. You see on the left, some of the things that we're going to go through in this course that are very timely and up to date. And then I have an emulator showing the finished product on the right so that I can show you through example what we're going to discuss throughout this course. So first of all, GitHub with CICD. We're going to be using GitHub in this course and we're going to use quite a bit of GitHub features. First of all, you see that we have our GitHub repository here. And we have Circle CI configured, which is CICD or Continuous Integration, Continuous Deployment. And we have a config YAML file, which configures our CI/CD pipeline. Let's take a look at our commit history. Next to these, you can see a red X or hopefully a green check mark, which indicates that our CI/CD pipeline passed. So we can click on this, we can view details, and this will take us over to our CI/CD pipeline. So the, the CI/CD pipeline will automatically run our unit test, and it will do several other things as well, like build our project and make sure that it compiles. This particular build did, did succeed. As you see here, it indicates that it was able to run 12 tests and we see edu.uc.jonesbr.myplantdiary plant data unit test search for redbud. It's calling out a specific unit test here that it ran successfully. So sure enough, in our application, we're going to write some unit tests as well. You see here, plant data unit test, just like so, a unit test that we wrote. And then we also have a plant data integration test as well. Several things that we'll take a look at throughout this course. So, so far we've covered GitHub with CICD integration and unit tests. Now let's continue and talk about autocomplete, JSON parsing, and room database. We take a look at the first screen of our application. And this application is a plant diary, which essentially is allowing the user to chronicle and diary a collection of plants over a series of time. So first of all, we have to have a plant name. Watch as I start typing EAS, and you'll see that Eastern Redbud appears, along with other plants that have those letters EAS. So you see that we have an autocomplete here, which is important because we want to make sure we know which plant the user has. And there are thousands and thousands of different genus and species combinations. So more than we could practically have in a combo box or something like that. But on the other hand, we want to give the user a predefined list so the user doesn't have to type the entire plant name, but instead can start typing and then can pick the nearest match. So we do that with an autocomplete. Now I mentioned there are thousands and thousands of plants. And so we don't want to hard code all of those plant names. Instead, we want to source it from a feed of JSON data. So this is a feed of JSON data that we're going to use. It has about 6,000 different plant names. And when I say plant names, I mean genus, species, cultivar. So think about a Fuji apple, something you would eat. That comes off of Malus domestica Fuji. Malus is the genus. Domestica is the species, and then Fuji is the cultivar. So 6,000 unique combinations of genus, species, and cultivar. That's what's feeding this autocomplete. But we know that if we have an autocomplete, it's going to filter every time the user types a letter. And so we don't want to have to make a network call every time the user types a letter. So to make it more efficient, we're storing this in a room database. So a room database is something that is local on the device so that it can work essentially offline and also it works around any kind of network latency. So initially we receive the data by parsing a JSON feed. Then later, after we have the data, we store it in a local room database and we use that room database to populate this autocomplete. Developing for Room is quite straightforward. We simply have a few annotations that we need to add to our DTO, and also we need to make a very simple DAO, which is just an interface with some annotations, and then we need to make a simple bootstrap class for Room. So that's a look at our autocomplete, and then JSON parsing, which we're going to do with a library called Retrofit, and then Room. Now I'm going to skip down for just a moment and talk about authentication with Firebase. A lot of times when I see people build apps, they want to build a login screen as the first screen. And I often say, avoid doing that because users want to play with your app for a little bit before they want to give you information about a login. That's number one. Number two, don't write the login screen yourself because this has already been done. Not just the login screen, but also 
all of the administration of logins, like forgotten passwords and things like that. So we're going to do authentication with Firebase, which is quite straightforward for the value that it gives us. So I click on this guy and it's going to give me an option to either log in with Google or log in with my email. We can also add things like log in with Twitter, log in with Facebook, Microsoft, all kinds of other things, all through authentication with Firebase. I'm going to go ahead and say sign in with Google. And you see this screen and all the screens that follow are actually managed by Firebase. I don't have to write them, I simply have to configure them. So I go ahead, I've already logged in on, on this device, so I simply pick my Google account, and then it's going to take me back to our application, and it will also contain any plants that I have already added. So you can see here an Austrian pine is the first plant, and you see that it has four events associated with it. I can click on the spinner and it will show me a list of my other plants. For example, I can pick the purple saxifrage, and it will show me that it has two events associated with it. Now I can click this button, and I can go to an event detail page and add a new event. So let's say water, and we'll say quantity one, gallons, Note that there are labels in each of these text boxes, and when I put my cursor in and I start typing, those labels go away. So event date, we can put 05012020, uh, something like that. Description, uh, it had a dry spell. Then I can also take a photo. Now before I hit save, I want to show you something really neat, which is all the data that you're looking at here is stored in the cloud, in this case in Firebase Cloud Firestore. So you see that I have a collection of specimens, then underneath that I have all the specimens that we saw in the spinner earlier. I selected this one, which is the purple saxifrage, the one that we're currently using. Now take a look, under the purple saxifrage, there's a collection for events, and you'll currently see that there are two events. Now watch what happens when I press save. Nearly instantaneously, you see that a second event, or sorry, a third event appears here. And you also see the photo that we took and also the description of that photo right here. So let's go ahead and click in, and you'll notice that it has our date of May 10th, 2020. It had a dry spell, and then we were watering it with one gallon. Now what about the photo? Well, it's stored on the device, but we also can store it in Firebase Cloud Storage. And you see, I, I, you see here I have images and then I have a user ID, and then we can see all the photos that have been stored for this user. So we're taking advantage of several different things on this Firebase console. The database, the storage, and also authentication. As a matter of fact, if we take a look at authentication, you can see that it shows me being logged in today, right now, uh, with my tokenized user ID. Now that we've saved, let's go back to our app and let's go ahead and press this back button. Now if we look at the purple saxifrage, we see something very interesting, which is before we had two events, now you see a third event, and sure enough you see the photo that's associated with this third event. So you see the screen that we were just on where we added an event uh, has data that's showing in the screen that we're looking at now where we're looking at all of our specimens. So in other words, we're sharing data across two fragments, and that's what we call MVVM with live data in multiple fragments. We're sharing one view model with live data across both the specimen fragment, as you're looking at here, and also the event fragment that we were just on. So we've managed to look at each of these. GPS, you see that we have GPS that's coming in up here, and that GPS stores with our specimens, if you look, to the right, you'll see that these uh, several of these have GPS markers on them. So we've covered all of these so far, and we've also covered the cloud concepts that we're going to look at. Let's look at the final one, which is Google Maps. So I click over here to this little map icon, and we'll see a Google Map will appear. This map shows the location of all of the specimens that we've GPSed. Now, you notice that there's a marker. You can click on the marker, and you can see information about which plant this is. It will give you a little description, as well as a latitude and longitude. And there's a lot more that you can do with it. But one really neat thing about having a Google Map with live data is that the map is observing on the live data. So as the data changes, the map updates automatically. Let's take something like our uh, this plant here, and let's change the latitude value from 39 to 45, and I'll hit enter. 
and you notice that the marker moves up just like so. Uh, automatically, you see that the map updated automatically as soon as I press that. Let's go to another one. Let's choose, uh, let's say this, I don't know what this is, beautiful ornamental grass. It's a feather reed grass. I have longitude of minus 77. Uh, why don't we change that to minus 90? And once again, you see that the map updates automatically. And uh, there's our feather reed grass right there, a beautiful ornamental grass, just like so. So that's one of the neat things about using live data is we get this automatic response on our user interface. And that works throughout our app with the events in the specimen screen and also with that map screen. So we're going to get to cover quite a few emerging topics in this course from GitHub with CICD to Cloud Concepts to Jetpack, Android Q, Google, Google Maps, quite a bit else. And I really am excited for this course. I hope you are too. Thank you, and I look forward to reading your comments.